Hello everybody, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Buongiorno a tutti, è bello di essere con voi oggi. Okay, I switch now. Eh, Cambio adesso, ora. Allora, guardate un attimo quel, uh, quell'annuncio. Uh, just take a moment to look at this uh, announcement on the screen. C'è qualcosa che stona? Is there something here that doesn't resonate? Seems a bit off key. Qualcosa che non vi aspettereste o che dite? That when you look at this kind of announcement that you wouldn't expect that Non ho sentito, scusa. Ha detto follower. Ah. Oh, to have 2 million followers, over 2 million followers. Wow. Altro? Is there something else? The pastor of five churches. That, yeah, pastoring five churches. Mm -hmm. Instead of just shepherding one, you've got to have five, right? It's a lot of work. <laughs> CEO, Soul Empowerment. You don't know if that's a band or if that's a, right? <laughs> ok, allora abbiamo creato questo, non esiste davvero questa persona. You need to know, uh, we made this up. It, it, it's not going to happen, it doesn't exist. This guy's not even a pastor, we don't know who he is. Ok, so. <laughs> sì, è, è, è un attore di Canva. He, he's, a, he's an actor on the app of Canva, that's all. That's, that's all it is, it's just... Just an actor. <laughs> Però diventa per noi uno strumento per riflettere. It, it, we put this advertisement here, like we made this fake, fake event, so that we would reflect and, and, and really challenge the church a little bit. Per quale motivo? For what reason? Perché a volte uh, possiamo essere abbagliati, possiamo... Uh, <laughs> Sì, abbagliati va bene, dà delle informazioni riguardo la grandezza, la fama ed altro, il potere riguardo una persona. When you see an advertisement like this, a lot of times you can be very impressed by all the credentials and all the pluses and all the celebrity that seems to be there, plus just that, it's just got a cool look, you know? Mm -hmm. It looks good. Ma perché? Perché questo ovviamente è il linguaggio a cui siamo abituati uh, a sentir parlare ogni giorno. And Yet, we're impressed by this, but it doesn't shock us too much, or we don't discern it too much, because we hear language like this almost every day. E quindi per noi, sentire una persona che si presenta parlando di tutto quello che ha fatto, del suo potere, uh, della sua fama, è normale. And so for us to hear about how much a guy like this is a celebrity and how much he's an influencer is really pretty normal for us in this day and age. E purtroppo... And sadly... A volte è anche normale nel mondo cristiano. At times it becomes normal also in the church. Dove mettiamo uh, come evidenza tutte le cose che abbiamo fatto. Where we um, um, mettere evidenza nel senso. Uh, mettiamo alla luce. Che yeah, we, we really uh, want to actually promote celebrity. And we, okay. wanna, we want people to be able to highlight this, like look at that power, so highlight it. Yeah. E quindi la cosa che facciamo è uh, di evidenziare le nostre forze. And so then the first thing that we do is we, we start to compare and look, and, and maybe even look down at our own strengths when we look at an advertisement like this, at somebody who seems to have received so much success. E la cosa più naturale che ci viene è quella invece di nascondere le nostre debolezze. And so the natural thing, the response, human response, is to begin to hide our weaknesses in comparison to their strengths. Oggi quello che vedremo invece Instead, today, what we are going to invite you to see è proprio collegato alla potenza, al potere che c'è quando noi... Um, fronteggiamo le nostre debolezze. Is truly connected to what we experience uh, in regarding power, the true power that God gives when we confront our very own weaknesses in our own lives. Uh, questo finto pastore che abbiamo creato. All right, so this imaginary pastor that we made. 
sarebbe potuto tranquillamente essere uno dei protagonisti della storia che vedremo oggi in secondo Corinzi. Okay, he could easily be one of the protagonists of the story that we're going to read today in what Paul was encountering back in Corinth. Per gli uomini che erano uh, al ritiro, for the men that were at the men's retreat, Oggi avremo la possibilità di poter rivedere e approfondire parte del messaggio che io ho portato lì. We're going to just touch a little bit on some of the message that I was able to start there but I wasn't able to finish up there. So we're going to complete that today. Quindi vediamo un attimo qual era il contesto a Corinto let's in quel look momento. At, let's look at Corinth and the Corinthians context for just a moment. Allora, Corinto era stata distrutta. Uh, Corinth was destroyed. E nel momento in cui uh, uh, by an earthquake, correct? Terremoto. You know better than me. Yeah, and also <laughs> also invasion from Rome. Yeah, okay. Eh. Tu sei dall'Italia, dai. Sì, lo so. Dai, okay. eh, nel momento in cui è stata ricostruita, una delle caratteristiche principali in the moment that it was rebuilt, one of the principal characteristics of the city era che era stata ripopolata con tante nuove persone, ovviamente. Was that a lot of new people were resettled into the city. C'erano greci, ebrei, liberti romani, cioè ex schiavi. So you had ex slaves, you had Romans, you had Greeks, you had Jews. Quindi era un centro economico dove c'erano tantissimi scambi tra le persone. Uh, there was, it was a great center of trade, so you had a lot of people coming and going because they were trading uh, their wares and markets. Ma soprattutto non c'era un'aristocrazia ben definita come era in altre città. Okay, so in other cities around Corinth there was a, sta a stabilized or an established aristocracy. In Corinth there was not an established aristocracy. So if you if you can say it your 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 more celebrity or wealthier people uh, were um, would come up from the lower class. It was esatto. easier for upward mobility in society at Corinth. Un po' come può essere adesso per tanti punti di vista. In a lot of cities it's similar today. Ok. Eh, quindi cosa succedeva? Che chi lavorava abbastanza, chi aveva talento, chi era furbo, capiva quali erano le giuste strade, poteva nel giro di poco tempo arrivare a fama e denaro. Ok, so if somebody would apply themselves and they would work hard or maybe they were crafty and they could really work through the markets and they could, um, uh, or that they had uh, opportunities for trade and markets, etc., then they could very quickly in Corinth compared to all the other cities uh, rise in the level of their status, fame and celebrity and also wealth. Quindi capitava di, di vedere queste persone che nel giro di pochi anni diventavano delle superstar e dire wow, lui ce l'ha fatta. It just so happened that a lot of people in a very short time became superstars of that day there in Corinth. È un po' una forma primitiva di quello che adesso avviene oggi con YouTube, TikTok uh, o altri strumenti che permettono alle persone velocemente di raggiungere fama e successo. Yeah, so it's uh, very similar to what we experienced by the if you will, the influencing power of, of the socials, the social media sites. Uh, they propelled somebody to fame, okay, through their followers, through uh, word of mouth, etc. Back then, Corinth was your social media. It was the place where it became social, okay? E proprio riguardo a questo, Tim Savage ha affermato. So Tim Savage wrote this. Uh, Tim Savage is a pastor in Arizona. In Corinth, a friend of ours, actually, uh, know him well. In Corinth, perhaps more than anywhere else, social ascent was the goal. Boasting and self-display the means, personal power and glory were the reward. Quindi cosa succede? In questo clima, in questa cultura, in that environment, here's what happened. I Corinzi cominciano ad avere alcuni dubbi rispetto a Paolo. The Corinthians, hearing all of this and all that celebrity, began to doubt the Apostle Paul. He wasn't there. All'inizio, la prima volta che lui era andato, era andato tutto bene, avevano accolto il Vangelo, però piano piano, uh, a causa di, questo, di questa influenza molto forte, hanno cominciato a vacillare. When Paul went to Corinth to begin to speak to them the first time, it went pretty well. 
they received the gospel, the church was established, uh, believers were growing in the faith, they welcomed him, and uh, there was a new opportunity for the gospel, and then Paul had to continue go, to go and plant other churches. E quindi la domanda era, ma che sembianze ha il potere evangelico? Uh, un apostolo, come dovrebbe essere davvero? Ok, so the, the question then, as he left, began to um, be asked, like, in, in comparison with those who were more popular in the city of Corinth, the question became, well, Paul, what kind of strength does he have? Uh, what kind of authority does he have? Uh, what, are, what are his capacities in comparison with what they were seeing every day in the, in the square of the city? Mm. Infatti, se ricordate, proprio nel primo capitolo di, uh, di Primo Corinzi, già uh, c'era stata una piccola diatriba rispetto a chi fosse migliore tra Paolo, uh, Apollo, Pietro e Gesù stesso. Yeah. So, if you remember back in this first letter that he wrote, Paul was already correcting these divisions that started to take place over celebrities. In other words, they were trying to compare who was more important and powerful between Paul, Jesus, Peter and Apollos as he, as he was a great speaker and orator there. Quindi cosa succede? Che mentre Paolo non è presente, arrivano questi sommi apostoli. So what took place for Paul was that in the middle of all that, there's a group and then some other men who arrive who Paul nicknames the super apostles. That's in the second letter to the Corinthians. E questi super apostoli, questi sommi apostoli, avevano tutti delle caratteristiche che... Uh, rispetto al modo di pensare di Corinto erano perfetti e straordinari. Yeah, so these super apostles, when they came to Corinth, it was a perfect environment for them to be able to flourish on the social scene. They had all the characteristics you needed to become a top influencer, if I can put it that way. E quindi quali erano queste caratteristiche? So what were some of these credentials or characteristics of the super apostles? Beh, innanzitutto avevano a molti soldi. You see there they were extremely wealthy. When you have wealth it was associated with blessing or success. Avevano delle lettere di referenza molto importanti che provenivano da Gerusalemme. So from Jerusalem they had these well studied doctors, you know, leaders who had also written their recommendation letters. Poi dicevano di aver avuto esperienze straordinarie dal punto di vista Uh, spirituale. They also proclaimed to have these other experiences that were uh, visionary experiences, spiritual experiences that the other people in the church probably hadn't had, but were very attractive because also, say, Apostle Giuseppe, certo. because also around Corinth there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of ecstatic religions that are taking place. You have um, many, there are many temples all along the way between Corinth and Athens. You have all these temples and all these gods and all these ecstatic experiences where they're drinking a lot of alcohol, staying up, they're, they're becoming inebriated, there's a lot of uh, spiritual feeling and they're trying to go into trances and other things. You have to understand that world was highly seeking the spiritual. So here they come saying, we're spiritual, we've had visions and we've had spiritual experiences and then Well, that attracts these maybe young believers, okay? Anche perché, perché also erano degli abili oratori, sapevano parlare benissimo e attirare l'attenzione e le menti delle persone. Because unlike us, they were very good orators and they could keep people's attention. Quindi um, Utilizzavano anche tutta la conoscenza e gli studi che avevano fatto. And they used all of this, uh, all this knowledge, spiritual knowledge, knowledge of the Torah, knowledge of the traditions, and they would come and they would build these, if you will, spiritual story experiences. Per questo motivo la presa che avevano sulle persone cominciava ad essere grande ma anche minacciosa. And for that, they had a great grip or control over the minds of people, and that not only became, if you will, their control, but it also became a threat, a threat to the gospel itself. Quindi abbiamo i super apostoli. So here we have lato. super apostles on one side. E poi abbiamo Paolo. And we got Paul on the other. E noi siamo abituati a leggere le lettere di Paolo e vediamo la forza che c'è nelle sue lettere. And we are, if, if you've read Paul, 
you're already habituated in the sense of understanding how strong he was and how knowledgeable he was in his letters. Però but, la sua presenza but his presence, era diversa. Was e infatti, Different. una delle accuse che viene fatta a lui è proprio questa. One of the things that happened in his life was actually this. If we read in 2 Corinthians 10:10, 10, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak. These are these super apostles. He's talking what they're saying to the Corinthian believers, and his speech doesn't count for anything. It, it doesn't have any merit, really. Quindi the, the way that he speaks, by the way, the way that he speaks is is uh, he's a weak orator compared to us. You see. Quindi cominciavano a vederlo come un apostolo un po' debole. And so they started to look at him as a he's apostle, okay, but just a little weak. E ci sono altre cose di cui Paolo viene accusato e che emergono proprio in questi capitoli. So there are other things that begin to emerge uh, from that standpoint, they began to emerge with other criticisms of Paul. Uh, first one, he did not have an impressive physical presence. Look at what they're looking at on the outside, do you see? I think he wants me both to read and preach these. Okay, so number two, he was meek and gentle in his leadership. That's a problem when a pastor becomes a translator of another pastor, It's right? It's co-preaching. It's co-preaching. I like it. I like it. If, if they can handle it, though. Yeah. Uh, he was meek and gentle in his leadership. In other words, meekness was equated with weakness. Esatto. Uh, I'm reading your mind. That's all sì, I have. Sì, sì, infatti, infatti. Uh, he did not speak with eloquence. Quindi l'abbiamo visto, non aveva queste, uh, questa capacità di uh, ammaliare, di coinvolgere così tanto come facevano gli altri il suo pubblico. He didn't have the capacity like some of the others to wow the crowd. E una delle cose che lui non faceva era quella di uh, essere orgoglioso dei suoi soldi. Ok, so a lot of people are making money and he would not, and, and they would they would boast in that and they would show their success. Again, that's external, and he would not boast in his money. In fact, he was boasting often, if you read his letters, in his poverty. E anche un'altra cosa, però, lui utilizza questo anche per evidenziare come invece i sommi apostoli probabilmente stavano cominciando a opprimere, da un punto di vista economico, uh, la Chiesa senza che loro... Uh, cioè, e loro subivano questa cosa in maniera passiva. Okay, so here's one of the things that was probably going on why Paul begins to mention this is because it was most likely that the super apostles were starting to oppress the church, uh, kind of a soft oppression of the church economically, like gathering the donations for themselves or calling for money and, and support for themselves. And uh, the church wasn't strong enough or mature enough to even comprehend this is what's going on. Uh, they're, they're here uh, shearing the sheep, if you will, taking, uh, taking the money from them. E un'altra critica che veniva fatta so another criticism that was take, a, a that Paolo took place. Era, cos, era collegata al fatto uh, che lui costantemente aveva avuto difficoltà fisiche, era stato in sofferenza e quindi non aveva l'impressione di essere un super apostolo perché eh, lo vedevi e dicevi... Mm, perché è così debole. Yeah, and simply, when you looked at the Apostle Paul, he, he's, he's not a good-looking movie actor. He's not, he's not Mike Genero here on the, on the screen that we had. Uh, his physical appearance, uh, he's kind of short, not all that good-looking, etc. And then he's going through all these sufferings and all these hardships. And usually, it's, if your gospel has wealth, it also has to have health, you know? And this guy's always getting beat up or tortured or look at his scars or... Uh, look at his age or his hurts and pains, you know. And so uh, you look at him physically and he's just not that apocalyptic, good-looking leader that you're hoping for. Guardate infatti il versetto uh, che c'è alla fine, no? Please look at 2 Corinthians 13, uh, 3a. C'era sempre questo dubbio. There's always this doubt. He's at the end of his second letter, it's chapter 13, And he's saying, since you are seeking proof that Christ is speaking in me, I have to list all of these things. You're still doubting whether Christ is working through me. Quindi dopo tutto quello che lui aveva insegnato, dopo tutto quello che era avvenuto, ancora c'erano questi dubbi su di lui. After all of his investment, all of his teaching, still there's coming this uh, doubt every time. 
E quindi la domanda che sia loro a quei tempi so the question, stavano avendo, yeah, the question that was happening or arriving to them at that time was simply, ma anche che noi potremmo avere a volte, also we can have the very same uh, question at times, è questa. Here's the question. What constitutes a proper manifestation of the Spirit in the ministry of the Gospel? How do you know who the Spirit is? How do you know if He's true as someone is teaching the Holy Spirit? Okay? Perché si trovavano di fronte a due scenari opposti l'uno all'altro. Yeah, here's the Corinthian church and they're looking at two different groups calling themselves apostles. One apostle Paul weak with all these bad appearances and then you have all these great talented uh, guys with capacity fame celebrity and money on this whole side this whole group calling who Paul says are super apostles right so who do you choose who do you follow who do you listen to quindi proviamo a vedere un po' comunque quali erano le caratteristiche dell'insegnamento uh, degli apostoli in quel periodo so let's let's look at the basis of gospel ministry for the apostles in that period okay C'erano fondamentalmente uh, due caratteristiche che erano collegate alla parola e alle opere. Two fundamental characteristics for the apostles were what they said and then what they did, words and deeds. Quindi per quanto riguarda le parole c'era questo, uh, questo amore nel, nel ragionare, nel parlare con le persone, nel fargli comprendere chi era Gesù Cristo e quali erano anche, uh, sì, alcuni errori che ci potevano essere nella maniera di pensare della cultura attuale. Um, Rispiego? Sì. Uh, era importante... Uh, It was important in their world. Allora, il ragionamento era fondamentale, yeah, soprattutto... Yeah, reason was fundamental. You're talking about the Greeks here. Sì. E Paolo aveva imparato a fare questo. And Paul had learned how to reason well. E aiutare le persone a comprendere anche quali potevano essere uh, gli errori nella maniera di pensare. And as he reasoned, he, it was very, it, one of his gifts was to be able to help others discover and see the errors that they were making in their own reasoning. Portandoli sempre verso Cristo. Always bringing them toward Christ as he would open these arguments and respond to arguments. E a volte, accanto proprio a questo ragionare, c'era right una serie di uh, manifestazioni, opere, segni, miracoli there, there che a, potevano testimoniare di quello che stava accadendo. There would be a series of demonstrations of signs and wonders that would affirm and, and would validate what he was already saying that would happen as he was preaching or reasoning with them. Però, However, sappiamo che uh, quando parliamo soprattutto uh, del secondo punto, quindi delle opere, However, when we do look again at the second part here on the slide of the word deeds and actions, proprio per il potere che questa cosa ha, because of the power that deeds contain, il rischio è uh, di concentrarsi sull'esteriorità come se fosse uno spettacolo. It is very easy then to be tempted to concentrate on the exterior of a person and that becomes an obstacle. E quindi la domanda diventa fondamentale, la domanda fondamentale diventa come parole e uh, azioni, opere possono diventare degli idoli. Okay. So The question, the fundamental question that happens when you have words and deeds, especially when you have these outer signs, which can cause people to think on the exterior, is you start to ask yourself, can words and deeds become idols? One, way, one thing, I was working on the translation for these slides, but Francesco also added, not only can they become idols, but how do they become idols? How do we vacillate between words and deeds and that these things, spiritual words and deeds, can become actual idols in our own hearts and lives? Vedremo come possono diventarlo, ma Paolo ci aiuta a capire come non devono diventarlo. Ok, we're, gonna, we're going to see how this can happen, but Paul is going to specifically teach how they must not become our idols and how these things cannot, must not be allowed to um, cause us to arrive at the thirst for power. E lo fa in diverse parti uh, della will, Bibbia. He's going to do that 
throughout different parts of 1 and 2 Corinthians, ok? Adesso però vedremo proprio la descrizione che viene fatta uh, in atti di quello che lui faceva. Ok, so first let's look at Acts, where this took place, the, the, the scenario, and Paul went in, this is 17, he went in, as was his custom, three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. The idea of suffering and rising. He's preaching to Greeks here in Acts 17. Suffering and rising would have just been absolute folly uh, to them. Quindi vedete, c'è una parte in cui lui ragiona con loro. So there's a part that you see that he reasons with them. Ma dove li porta? Li porta sempre verso Cristo But e la croce. Look at the second verse here that we saw in verse 3. He's bringing them to Jesus and he proclaims Jesus to them. Quindi Therefore. Quindi il ruolo che ha, che ha il miracoloso, il ruolo che hanno uh, segni e prodigi, prodigi, non è mai quello di sostituire, ma è quello di convalidare. All right, so here's your first, here's your first point to be able to discern uh, whether something like a deed or an action can become an idol instead of, or words. This one here is that your miraculous signs or wonders were meant to accompany the word as it was being first revealed with the Apostle Paul. They were meant to validate or co-validate that which he was saying by the power of the Spirit. Okay? It was never meant to substitute the message of Christ. Like, look at the signs that I can do versus Jesus himself and the sign that he did do. Perché oggi questa, anche oggi questa per uh, alcune persone diventa una grande tentazione utilizzare segni prodigi per validare se stessi, non Gesù. Yeah, this is actually, we're looking back at Corinth, but I'm telling you guys, uh, and Francesco touched on something, it is everywhere in, in this land, and I imagine you may have experienced some of this back where you're from too, and that is that this is a very popular thing today to be able to proclaim spiritual power, spiritual experiences, to look, to cause people to look at the signs and wonders and to be able to proclaim spiritual power instead of bringing them to Christ and revealing Christ. This is very common uh, in our world. Ad esempio in Italia, for, here in Italy, for example, ci sono dei posti dove si va per ricevere determinati miracoli. Yeah, there's a people who take voyages, there's places you go so that you can receive certain miracles. Dando gloria a quel posto. Giving glory to that place. O al santo, alla persona. Or to the saint, co or to the person. Collegata a quel, a that's, quel posto. That's connected to that place. It's like the spiritual Aura and mysterious place. Ma la stessa cosa può essere fatta anche non con persone morte, ma con persone che dicono di guarire o di fare alti segni prodigi yeah. uh, miracolosi. Many times there are still people even today, they don't have to be dead, of course, but there are people today that are living that come and proclaim, I'm going to do signs, I'm going to do healings, they are approaching you based on the miracle and the wonder, not based on the word. Quindi... So, therefore, by focusing attention on what he was saying and not on how he said it, Paul switches the argument, he prevented his listeners from getting distracted from what was truly important. Because the super apostles were focusing on how he was saying it, Paul says, no, 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 come back to what I am saying. Stop criticizing the packaging. <laughs> Perché? È così facile lasciarsi impressionare da uh, fumo, da uh, fuochi d'artificio ed altro. Yeah, it's very easy for people to become distracted and also wowed by lasers and smoke. E quindi qual è il messaggio? Ripetiamo, qual è il messaggio che sottolinea sempre Paolo. So Paul comes and he underlines this message. What is that message? We're going to see this in 1 Corinthians 2.2. It is the message, for I decided, I was completely certain, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified. That's it. There it is. My baseline message. Quindi nei capitoli che vanno dal 10 in poi di secondo Corinzi. So in our passages that we're looking at today in 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. 
Paolo va dritto al punto. Paul goes directly to this point from this baseline Svelan- in 1 Corinthians 2. Svelando cosa stava uh, sviando i Corinzi. R- revealing the thing that is causing the Corinthians to change the course. Quindi possiamo leggere adesso versetti 2 e 3. So now look at here here in our passages that we're concentrating on. Here's Paul coming to the point. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 3. For I feel in me a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Verse 3. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts inside will also be led astray from a sincere and a pure devotion to Christ Jesus. Quindi Paolo stava esprimendo una santa gelosia. He's, hope, he's really showing them a holy jealousy, guys. This is not just a personal for me jealousy. It's a jealousy on behalf of God. Quindi la sua paura era che come un uomo che cerca di rubare la moglie di un altro uomo. Here's his, here's his concern, if we can just say it directly. He's concerned that there's a man or a group of men who are trying to steal someone else's wife. Alla stessa maniera i falsi maestri cominciassero a, a sedurre Corinzi affinché lasciassero il loro vero marito e commettessero adulterio spirituale. And they're trying and they are trying in the same way to convince these Corinthian believers to leave their groom from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to abandon him and to practice spiritual adultery with their devotion and their, their purity toward the wrong apostles and the wrong message. Quindi da un punto di vista spirituale Paolo si sentiva il padre dei Corinzi. And so from one point he's, he seems to be expressing his sense of feeling like a father to them. E nella tradizione ebraica il padre aveva proprio la responsabilità affinché la sposa arrivasse vergine al matrimonio. Yes, and in Jewish tradition it was very important for a father, a Hebrew father, to be able to make sure that his daughter arrived at her wedding day a virgin. Ma quindi qual era il rischio? Il rischio era che loro potessero commettere adulterio spirituale. And what's the risk that they're having is that they have already been betrothed, all right? They've already been engaged to their husband from heaven and that he comes back and he finds them in spiritual adultery. Infatti ogni volta che noi diamo il nostro cuore a qualcos'altro che non è Dio, stiamo commettendo adulterio spirituale. Every time that we're giving our lives, our attention, our focus, our adoration, our hope into something that's not in Christ Jesus, we start to worship a false god. When we worship false gods, the Bible says that spiritual adultery. We commit it more often than we think that we do. E guardiamo what he said, I'm just adding that in. Bonus. E guardate il versetto 3. Look at verse 3 now. Sta parlando 3 or 4? Eh, uh, versetto No, 3, 3. 3. Okay, so we're sì. going back to 3. Sta Dicendo, guardate le vostre menti. He says, watch your minds, what you're allowing to think on and what you're processing. Le vostre menti sono sviate alla stessa maniera di come Satana ha ingannato Eva. Your minds, because you are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, can easily be led away, just like they were, uh, in the garden, from and also lied to. We can keep repeating the lies and making them larger in our own lives. Quindi non sta dicendo ok, siamo semplicemente apostoli differenti. He's not saying to the Corinthians, "Hey guys, yeah, you know, we're just all different apostles. You know, it's just kind of a, a group we're all saying the same thing in different ways." Sta dicendo Satana vi sta sviando. He's saying we're not saying the same thing in different ways and it's Satan behind this that's causing you to go and commit adultery against God. Quindi, nel versetto 4, in verse 4, he follows it up with this, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, another Jesus, then the one who we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit, okay, small spirit there, from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel, small g, from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough, and you're tolerant of this. 
Quindi abbiamo un linguaggio simile, dei significati che possono essere simili, ma che in realtà sono completamente diversi. Allora, ci sono diverse ipotesi rispetto, rispetto uh, a quello a cui si sta riferendo Paolo. In regard to what Paul is actually saying here about these different things. Ad esempio, cosa può significare un altro Gesù? C'è chi ipotizza che potesse parlare, ad esempio, di un prodigio ellenistico, una specie di uh, semidio okay. nella tradizione. Yeah, they, they could be uh, talking about different characters who actually show wonders in their lives and become a uh, half messiah. Sì, un, un super ebreo. Like a super Jew, if you will. That's sempre what these super apostles are talking sì, about. Soprattutto super, esatto. Super Jew. Super Jew. Ok. Però quando arriviamo alla questione dello spirito diverso, But when we arrive at the second part here about a different spirit, arriviamo a un punto particolarmente importante. Here we're arriving at something that's particularly important. Perché uh, per chi di voi ricorda l'epistola ai Galati? It, remember the Galatians, the, the letter to Galatians that Paul wrote? Era successo che anche lì erano arrivati degli ebrei giudi- giudaizzanti. They had a similar problem. They had these Judaizers that came up into the area of Galatia and were also leading them astray. E avevano cominciato a, a predicare cose diverse dal vero Vangelo. That, uh, Ma c'è una differenza, perché in quel caso era più concentrato sulla legge. In questo caso in this case, however, abbiamo l'introduzione proprio invece dello Spirito. Qui abbiamo una translation called the Spirit. Quindi si stavano focalizzando su uh, uno spirito diverso. They are focalizing, focusing on a spiritual experience, a different spirit of power, not necessarily obedience to law, but now power and experience. Che può significare? Allora, ci sono tante ipotesi rispetto a questo. Well, we could have a number of hypotheses through this. C'è chi parla di una falsa spiritualità. The, uh, false spirituality. Oppure chi parla che erano sotto l'influenza di spiriti maligni. They were maybe under the influence of evil spirits, elementary spirits. Però in linea generale si pensa che loro stiano proprio parlando dello Spirito Santo. But the general line here is that they were making a false spirit, holy spirit. Nel senso che probabilmente stavano enfatizzando eccessivamente le loro esperienze. What was happening most likely was that they were improperly emphasizing and exaggerating a, an experiential kind of religion. The experience uh, of these uh, of, that were very subjective. They were not objective in the spirit who leads us to Jesus. They were subjective in their personal experience and they were promoting a lot of that. That's what they would preach. E rivendicavano quindi la loro capacità di profetizzare, di parlare in lingue, di avere uh, rivelazioni speciali in, o cose simili. In that they would come into the church, they would preach maybe in tongues, uh, they would come into the church and do prophecies especially and get people in this in the playground of speculation. E il tutto non era concentrato o proiettato verso Gesù. Ma era concentrato su loro stessi. It was on their or what they were saying, on sul loro orgoglio. On their pride. Sul fatto di diventare sempre più potenti, famosi e oh. avere... Um, on the possibility to become uh, more powerful and have more celebrity. Esatto, e avere and più presa, control. più presa sui fedeli di Corinto. And they have more control especially over that church. Quindi, so back to Mike. Lui sarebbe potuto essere assolutamente uno di questi super so, apostoli. As we put up before, he could absolutely be presented here in a way just like the super apostles would have presented themselves back in their day. Quindi da un lato c'era 
Super Mike. From one side we have Super Mike on this side. E dall'altro invece abbiamo il debole Paolo. And on the other side we have weak Paul. Okay. Because messo... here's his message now. Jesus Christ, him crucified. There, there, there's the subject. I live for that. Notice he only has one follower. He's the follower of Christ. <laughs> e vedete anche il suo messaggio può essere cioè, si parla di, di morte, di... Here's, here's a message that doesn't talk about soul reanimation, if you will, or power. He's talking about death in here. Sì, questa risurrezione, ma... This resurrection that seems so strange to the Greek mind. Esatto. E quindi... E quindi cosa è successo? C'è stato questo attacco sia frontale ma anche indiretto there was a attack against paul direct as frontal and then there was attack from the flank from the side on paul come a volte può avvenire nelle nostre vite that happens also in our lives at times a volte può capitare it can happen that che veniamo attaccati nel posto di lavoro we can be attacked also regarding our faith in places our workplaces possiamo essere attaccati uh, con gli amici with our friends e in tante altre situazioni. Many other e a volte può capitare che chi ci conosce tira fuori le nostre debolezze. And what happens often in that case is people who know us will attack us using our weaknesses. They're going to point them out. E fa leva su di esse. And uh, to also cause you to fall or trip over your own weaknesses. E quindi a volte noi ci sentiamo deboli. And therefore in that moment we feel weak. Spiazzati. We feel a little bit crushed. Fallen, crestfallen. There we go. E quindi le domande che Paolo poteva avere, ma anche noi possiamo avere sono queste. And these are the questions that Paul could have had and had to answer. They become our questions too. What could Paul have done in the face of this attack? What were his options and what are your options? In the face of something similar. Come ti comporti quando sei messo alle corde? What, how do you behave, how do you react and respond in the face of challenge over your weaknesses? Possono essere queste due delle opzioni? You have two possible options here. Have you reacted in these ways? The first one, demonstrate miracle strength and power. L'avrebbe potuto fare Paolo dire ok adesso mi farò vedere davvero chi ha il potere di Dio. Um, he had the opportunity to be able to say that he had the power of God. Look, me too. Ok, that would be his movement. Me too, I have the power of God. I can show you these things. And to force act out these works and miracles and wonders. Perché questa a volte è la nostra reazione. Noi quando ci troviamo in difficoltà Vogliamo nascondere le nostre debolezze e contrattaccare. Here's what happens in our lives. We have the other option. Either we can try to force it on the external or we can try to hide it on the internal. We kind of go behind the scenes and say, oh, I don't compare. I don't compare to that person and so yeah, they're making me feel very inferior. That's fine. It's okay. But is, are those, either of those gospel ways? No, they're not. Però cosa fa Paolo? What does Paul do? What does he show us? Invece di soddisfare le aspettative dei Corinzi, lui fa esattamente il contrario. Instead of satisfying the expectations of the Corinthians who are looking at the other um, celebrities in their society, Paul goes the opposite direction. E pone l'accento sulle sue debolezze. And he puts the accent on his own weaknesses. He doesn't vaunt his powers or hide his weaknesses. He actually says, here, let me show you my weaknesses. Immaginatevi, no? Uh, nella vostra vita, davanti a tutti, parlare delle vostre debolezze. Che sfida sarebbe? Imagine in your own life uh, speaking about your own weaknesses to others. What kind of reaction do you think that they would have? Where you just said all out, cards on the table, I admit it. Guardare... You see a weakness, but... Guardare al loro volto, sentire un giudizio da parte degli altri. Looking at their faces, you share your weakness and seeing their judgment come right back upon you. Ma perché lo stava facendo Paolo? Why was Paul doing something like that? 
Why would he vaunt his weaknesses? Perché la potenza del Signore si era manifestata proprio nelle sue debolezze. Because he knew that by manifesting his weaknesses he would also give a channel for God to show his power through Paul's weaknesses. La potenza di Cristo aveva riposato in lui. The power e su di lui. of Christ rested in him. Quindi Paolo non ancorò la sua vita sulle sue forze, sulle sue capacità, ma anzi fece esattamente il contrario. Uh, lui si basò sulla grazia di Dio. Paul did not anchor his hopes in getting better in his weaknesses and his strengths. Instead, Paul looked to the gospel and said, God, work through me because I'm getting weaker and weaker the older I get and the more pains that I have. <laughs> Perché basarsi sulle proprie forze significava fare che cosa? Because if he based his, his, his life on his own strength, on his own strengths, here's what would have happened. Significava svuotare la croce del suo potere. It would have signified that he was emptying the cross of its power that he had already decided to preach and proclaim when he got to Corinth. If he, if, if he vaunted, if you will, in his strengths and tried to prove himself, he would have been an obstacle to the beauty and the power of the cross. He would have gotten in the way of Jesus. Quindi, cosa fa Paolo? So, so what does Paul do? Comincia proprio a parlare, aprendo il suo cuore, parlando di come uh, il Signore aveva lavorato attraverso le sue debolezze. So, Paul picks up the line now and he says, Now you have to see how God actually worked through my weaknesses. I'm not just going to tell you that God works through weaknesses. You have to see it. And then he writes in these last three chapters of, of 2 Corinthians these things. Here are some of the verses, right? Eh sì, questa è la parte, uh, una del cuore proprio del, uh, del discorso che lui ha fatto. So here Paul is, in a way, climbing the mountaintop and it's, we're at the apex of it, like, Here's my weaknesses and watch look at this argument. Look at how great this is in God and he, he gets us there with him, okay? And that will be in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. So we're just going to look through chapter 12, chapter 13. It says verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited. Wow, how many things in our lives do we need to keep us from becoming conceited? How easy is it to become conceited? Very easy. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan himself to harass me and to keep me, and he repeats it, from becoming conceited or trusting in my own strengths or vaunting who I am. And then verse 8, va bene? <laughs> three times I pleaded with the Lord about it. I went back to him. He repeats to us three times. I repeated back to him that it should leave me. But the Lord said to me, my favor is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness, or it's made complete, or people can see it. It's matured in your weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of those weaknesses. I want people to see them. I won't hide them so that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Just as the gospel rests within me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses. Because Christ is there. Insults, I can, I'm content with. Hardships, I'm content with. Persecutions and calamities also. For when I am weak, then I am completely able and strong. Quindi pensiamo alle nostre debolezze. So let's think about our own weaknesses. Non dobbiamo nasconderle. We don't have to hide them when Anzi, we're in Christ. Instead, dobbiamo pensare all'enorme uh, potenziale che hanno di far operare Cristo nelle nostre vite. We must believe and preach to ourselves the enormous potential of the power of Christ that lives through us when we are facing our weaknesses. Andiamo dal Signore, diciamo le Signore c'è questa cosa che mi tormenta, c'è questo aspetto della mia vita in cui davvero io mi sento debole, umiliato. Ti we, prego, Signore, aiutami. 
We must keep going back to Christ and looking at him and being able to call out to him and saying, this is an aspect of my own character, my own person that torments me. It tortures me. I feel inadequate. I feel inferior. I am less than what people say I should be. And yet I look at Christ. Please help me, oh Jesus, to see you in me. Perché io so che il tuo potere agirà in me. Because I know that your power will and is at work in my life. E Paolo sapeva a cui lui conosceva questo potere e lui fa riferimento proprio a ciò che è avvenuto nella vita del Salvatore. Because Paul lived the same uh, path of life. He saw what happened in the life of Jesus Christ and his life was mirroring that of Jesus. And so will ours. E lui testimonia questa cosa proprio nell'ultimo versetto che vediamo. And he testifies to this very fact in the last verse that we're going to look at today. And here it is. It's 2 Corinthians 13, so the page over, verse 4. For Jesus was crucified in weakness. That's what the, that's what the Greeks called it. That's what the super apostles may have called it. He was crucified in weakness. To die for your cause and not to overcome was called weakness. But Jesus lives now by the power of God. For we also then are weak in him. We're dying in him daily. But in dealing with you or in our um, confrontations or in working with you, we are living and we will live with him by the power of God. He says in Romans, if you died to with Christ, you must, this is Romans 6, you must also live with Christ. It, they come together. They cannot be separated because he's ne he will never be a dead God again. <laughs> e questo, questo non significa disprezzarsi o dire che siamo uh, dei falliti. It does not signify to us, it does not mean that we need to self-insult and self-loathe in our lives. It does signify that where we find our limits that we must turn and be looking where his power can start to become our power. Quindi, in Therefore, una società che predica esattamente il contrario. We are living in a society in the western world in a society that preaches the exact opposite of what we just heard. Dove costantemente ci dicono devi essere forte, forte, forte. Constantly you are being bombarded by messages that say you have to be strong. You must be strong. You must be tough. You must get through that kind of thing. Riconosciamo che l'unica e vera forza deriva da portare le nostre debolezze al Signore che trasformerà le nostre vite. We must recognize that God is looking for an opportunity to show his power through our weaknesses in every opportunity he's waiting for it. Turn to him, lean on him, look to him. That's where your true power comes from. 